Our next speaker actually comes not from a medical field, but uh, from an engineering and robotic field, but it ties in to some of the discussion we will have this afternoon in the area of uh, uh, telesurgery and, and, and in medicine. Uh, Dr. Greg Biden is the Chairman and Chief uh, Technology Officer of Penguin Automated Systems, uh, which he holds a PhD in mining engineering um, with specialty in technology and economics. Uh, he's also a professor in the School of Engineering and Laurentian University, uh, where he's teaching focused on mining and automation in robotics. In 2001, he was awarded the prestigious Canadian Research Chair in Robotics and Mine Automation. Um, his mining research work at Inco Limited uh, included pioneering telerobotic systems within the company around the world. This telerobotic work led to conceptualization and implementation of the world's first robotic mine prototype uh, at the 175 ore body. So he comes with a great deal of experience in robotics, uh, not for medicine, but for mining and telerobotics, uh, uh, which is of uh, great interest to uh, many of us. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Biden. Um, I remember saying, you know, how am I going to do this in Sudbury? Nobody in Sudbury has any idea about robotics. How am I going to do this? I'll have to go down to California. I'll have to go here. I'll have to go there. And they were good enough inside of the company to let me do all those things. And um, that work has given me the fortunate background of being able to talk to you today about what many people have worked on besides me that were really under, um, I like to call it a benevolent dictatorship. I was pretty open to ideas, but at the end of the day, inside of a big corporation, you're in charge. And so unless you make that happen, um, your bosses look at you. Um, the, the reason that you can say all that is I started off with a little tiny budget of about $100,000, and I finished in total spending about $300 million in making this happen. And so uh, the ability to do this with a lot of um, eyes and, and things. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of history, and then I'm going to show you where, where my research at the university went to and where um, our business is going to. Uh, the interesting part is I was a Canadian research chair and I chose not to be a Canadian research chair because as you get into commercialization, um, the academic world has a harder time with that. And um, it's funny because out of one mouth we hear that we want to see innovation and commercialization and out of the other mouth it's but we want the research qualifications and all those things and quite frankly I wasn't allowed to publish a lot of this work because it was a corporate secret. So um, I'm going to show you this. Uh, this is a really interesting picture. It's a new communication system that we've developed for underwater mining and I'll talk to you a little bit about it because it's opened up a really interesting commercialization door between us and MIT. Um, but I like to start with this quote. Whenever you look at a piece of work and you think that fellow is crazy, uh, then you want to pay some attention to that because one of you is likely to be. And you'd better find out which one it is because it makes an awful lot of difference. We went and did a number of things over the years that people thought we were absolutely crazy. Um, the other thing I want to just say is innovation. Creativity is, is, thing, is thinking up new things, but innovation is doing new things. And the doing part is really hard. Having been in a corporation, the, I know about the doing more than anybody else. Um, innovation is the process of turning ideas into manufacturable and marketable forms. Um, and I think that that's another really important quote. So one day I had a boss walk in to me and he said, you know, we have these mines and they're 8,000 feet deep and, and one of the problems that we have is we send somebody underground, they get there and they get trapped because the elevator gets used for everything else. And he said, what I'd really like you to do is invent the Star Trek transporter. I'd like to be able to transport this guy from this place to that place and go over here. <clears throat> and I, he's now become a very good friend, but I remember telling him he was crazy and he should leave my office. And uh, about five years later, we put this guy here, Chico Villeneuve, 
whose son beat him at video games in 1994 on the stage of the John Bassett Theater in downtown Toronto. And we ran uh, two mining machines simultaneously uh, over a network that was linked into the mine up in Sudbury. <clears throat> I like to put that into perspective because I know there's been lots of great work done at Mac, and there was a telesurgery done between North Bay and, and uh, um, Mc Hamilton. And uh, what I found interesting was the bandwidth required to make that happen was quite small, and the patient was strapped down, um, and they did all the work. So I want to give you that in a different context. This is now two moving gurneys going down about 8,000, between four and 8,000 feet underground. Both are being manipulated simultaneously by one person, and they're getting a productivity gain of almost 350% for what we're doing. Um, it's funny because in mining we do that stuff, but it doesn't get the same attention because in the medical field it's all about people and there's, there's 35 million people in Canada and 350 million people in the United States and everybody's worried about health, but nobody worries about where the metal comes to make the scalpels to help them. And so I found it interesting that we could do that. That was our total claim to fame, and, and it was one little article in the Globe and Mail. It made the business section, and it kind of went, geez, this was, this was quite something. And after that, it just died off the vine, and nobody really paid any attention while we carried on our work. Um, so we worked for many years on what we coined the term telemining. Part of the reason we talked, to, talked about it as telemining was when you talked about robotics and you talked about automation, the people inside of our business kind of glazed over and they didn't really get it. And it wasn't until we put it in the context of the telephone and the television and the tele this and the tele that that everybody went, oh, we get it now. And so what you really want us to do is be like we're on the other end of a telephone line running the pieces of mining equipment. Yes, that's what we want. And uh, we want to increase the distance between the machine and you, and we want to remove you away from the dirty, dark areas that are out there to be mined. Because it looks after you. Um, technically, what we're doing is a term called autonomation, not automation. Um, it's a Japanese term coined by the people at um, um, Yoshi Ono and um, uh, Shingo. Um, it's automation with the human touch. So we're not creating machines that self-repair, we're creating machines that get operated from surface. And people are, are able to stay away from the machines for periods of time, but we still have to fuel them, we still have to do all the regular processes. Um, it was interesting because it became a project that um, we put together that was a five-year project, over $26 million was spent in the joint project, but in my budget there was a huge amount of money we went, put toward it. And the idea was that this MAP project, which we called the Mining Automation Program, was led by INCO and myself, and we developed and demonstrated underground uh, robots between the period of 1992 and 1996. And we had over 20 systems um, up and running all simultaneously over the same computer networks, all requiring huge amounts of bandwidth. Um, we used latencies that were quite quick. Our latencies were actually 35 milliseconds, but we needed to stay within a 1.5 milliseconds, otherwise the operators would not be able to run the machines. So we were doing almost what Walt Disney did with animation. We were trying to create it so that it was going fast enough that the people could stay in, but keep it under the response times so that they were uh, in a good place. And then uh, we spent, as I said, a $300 million investment, and we couldn't publish. So I spent all this time doing all this work in a secret environment, which when I left INCO, I'm now allowed to talk about, because the project was done. 